Hey, what's going on guys? Jay's Two Cents here, and uh, you, I've talked about this before. I like to peruse Amazon and just find unique and different things to do reviews on. Um, I actually found a new cooler, and I'm gonna talk about that in a sec here, but I need to update this test bench, so I figured this would be like the last hurrah for my 10900K on here, because it is um, dated in the sense of doing cooler tests and stuff with the higher core density found in 13th gen, even 12th gen, and 7000 series AMD CPUs. It's gonna be time to do a full system overhaul. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and do this test on the 10900K anyway because of the fact that it is still a 20 thread processor and this one's set up to run 1.448 volts, which is a lot. Um, which is, as you can see, I currently have a 360 AIO on there. But I found these. This is the Alzai, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. I don't know why I'm suddenly talking like Linus. But anyway, it's the Max M120D Plus 2. <laughs> Quite the name on there. Anyway, what makes this one unique and different is as you can see, there is a screen directly on the cooler. So we're gonna see what the screen readout is, what kind of customization options you have there, and of course, can it even cool a high thread count CPU? Today's video is brought to you by the JSU Sense merch store. We got t-shirts and gaming mats and mugs and all that kind of stuff. So whenever you go buy our stuff, we don't have to put other ads here and other annoying crap. So go buy our stuff. I think I'm gonna do the white one today just cause it'll be contrasty and easy to film. But let's go and talk about some of the specs here. It supports ARGB, that's good to know. That's gonna be for the fans, obviously. Uh, temperature display, it's LGA 1700 compatible, 360 degree lightings. I, I like how they have to find things to put on the box. That just means that the RGB lighting goes all the way around. Dual PWM fans plus six heat pipes. Yeah, you heard that right. Six heat pipes and push-pull config out of the box. So I'm kind of excited about this one. In terms of price, this is not one of those. Here's an ultra cheap thing I found. It's $75.99. However, if we compare this to other coolers in this particular like size category, it's a pretty good deal given how big it is. Does it show what its actual, like, yeah, I need to see what its wattage dissipation is on here. Um, so before we start unboxing, let's go and talk about a little bit more of the specs. So it, Works on AMD AM4, and whether or not it's gonna work on AM5 is gonna have everything to do with the AM5 motherboard. We've talked about it a million times. 1700, 1200, 11.5X, 2011, 2066, and 1366. So as you can see here, the fans are 700 to 1900 RPM on the front fan, and then the back fan is 700 to 1700 RPM. I'm kind of curious as to why they're different there. 73.76 CFM, I'm, just, I'm wondering if that's total for both of those fans. But having two fans does not double your CFM, by the way. It just doubles, it, it increases your pressure uh, to overcome pressure drop. So anyway, 2.01 MMO H2O, that's our pressure, 38 dB. So not the quietest fans. Bearing type, fluid dynamic bearing. That's what FDA is. So that's one of the areas they're saving some cost. The things that are like ball bearings and sleeve bearing and stuff like that cost a bit more than a fluid dynamic. 300 milliamps, that's weird to put that on there. Doesn't show what its actual capability of cooling is regarding heat dissipation. Normally they'll show some sort of a wattage. The good news though is that it's su it support multiply platforms. Uh, like talking about wattage though, as you can see here, the Pure Rock LP, the low profile, shows right on there, it's 100 watt TDP. This is kind of important though, a small form factor cooler like this would definitely, you, it would be important to show how much can it cool because if I put a 100 watt cooler on a 230 watt TDP CPU, that is gonna be throttle city the moment it sees load, no matter what the load is. Copper base soldering. Copper base is soldered with heat pipes by reflow soldering with more eerier polishing. More, <laughs> more, more iry, more eye roar. Bill was talking about off camera, this is actually one of the better boxes, or like in terms of translations, could be worse. Anyway, this is what you get with it. I don't care, they could call it whatever the heck they want and they could use whatever language they want in terms of bad translations and spellings if it performs well. It's actually, that's solid. That is more solid than- <laughs> Come get hit with this plastic thing. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the cooler is actually fairly weighty. Um, I mean, the fans and everything are already on it. The fan design, interesting. There's quite a bit of gap between the K, like the actual frame and the blades themselves. And they're definitely two different fans. There's a bigger gap on the exhaust fan, the puller fan, than the push fan. The push fan has less of a gap. Maybe it just looks different because it's backwards. I, I'm seeing the backside. Um, Wait, no. Oh yeah, this is definitely one of, the, okay, so they are two different fans. You can see the cage is against the heat pipe, so this is one of those reverse fans where the cage is not on the side that's exhausting. So kind of neat that they thought of that level of detail. Um, the, the screen is obviously gonna be in there. This is like a, 
a smoked lens, like plastic cover, I'm worried about the scratching over time as you wipe it down because this stuff tends to scratch really badly. This is actually pretty well built. I'm not, I'm not gonna lie, this is, this, is, this is nice. Now one thing I'm a little concerned about in terms of the base size here is it's not, it's not super big. I get, it looks like it would cover a 1700, but barely. Like you would probably have a tiny bit of the IHS probably hanging off, but it's not terrible. You, to screw it down, as you can see, you've got these screw holes right here. Um, this is gonna go onto whatever brackets I'm assuming you use. It might be pre-installed for AMD, I'm not sure. But if you look down through there, you can see that there is a, a chamber that you could use to put a screwdriver down through. I'm assuming to do that. Okay, that just comes right off. Mounting screw holes. So I guess you could leave that off if you wanted. Otherwise, is this even magnetic in some way? Oh, it wasn't snapped down all the way. <laughs> so that had apparently come loose in transit. There we go, that comes off. This is how you access the screw holes so that you can tighten it down. This also looks like the two screws that are holding the cover on to be able to come apart so that you can get the fans off if you needed to. We do have a lot of other accessories though that came with this. I'm assuming this is gonna be all of our different mounting. So we get the T8 thermal paste. I don't know anything about it. No need to buy a Linus Tech screwdriver if you got one of these guys. This is kinda neat actually. So it's got a reversible screwdriver, which doesn't hold in there very well. That's just friction. There's not like a little ball retention. Anyway, you got your flathead and your Phillips. So that's kind of nice to see. So that's gonna fit obviously down through there. And as you can see, right on there like that. And here's our other retention brackets and such. So this is gonna be our Intel bracket and you can tell that just by the fact that it's a square. It looks like it has its own retention backplate system, which is kind of nice to see. And then our screws and stuff to mount that. So there's our AMD holes right there. So because these are not elongated, these are only gonna work, the AMD holes are only gonna work with AM4. So your AM5 motherboard needs to be AM4 cooler compatible by having the elongated holes that we've showed or the double hole drill rather than just the single for AM5. Some AM5 motherboards don't have that. So keep that in mind. Our biggest concern here honestly is gonna be overhang for uh, memory support. So check it out, that's pre-mounted. There we go, there's our retention bracket there. Now in terms of the cables and stuff, everything is hardwired. So this is all attached under the cover. And even though it's a white cooler, I kind of wish that these were black cables because they would still blend in better with the system, but whatever. So here are the cables that we've got. We've got our USB header. So this is gonna require a USB 2.0 header on your motherboard or at least a 2.0 to 3.0 adapter or a 2.0 motherboard adapter to a standard USB-A that you can plug into the backside of your motherboard if you don't have an available USB 2.0. This is our, obviously this is our fan header right here. So this is clearly split off at some point into both these fans. It's a single PWM four pin. Plug this into your CPU cooler, CPU one at least. We have here a SATA power plug, and then this is your ARGB splitter. So everything you need already pre-plugged in. You could bundle this up nice and tight for cable management, put it somewhere and then split it all off on the backside of your system. Before we do anything else, we need to get ourselves a baseline. So what I have on here, this is actually the Fantex um, 360 AIO. I forget the actual name of it. We are going to, we're going to use hardware monitor to monitor our core temps because our core temps are, in, are important. So here we go. You can see we're at 5.2 gigahertz all core. Ironically, the uh, 10th gen, the most I can usually get out of it's about 5253. So as you can see, in terms of core speed, it is starting to uh, fall behind, obviously, all the modern specs. This is three generations old for Intel. 70 on the package, 66, 65. And I need to let this go actually for a while just to let it normalize. Usually it won't take very long, but it will normalize in about the high 70s, um, which is actually pretty good. I did do voltage tuning and stuff to this. So we'll be using the exact same locked down settings for both voltage and core speed and all that. That way, as we do an AB comparison, this is just a 360 AIO, should not be compared to a water cooler, but I'm kind of curious as to how much, it, how much different it'll perform. But with having all the settings locked down, the voltage is set to static, which means they're not gonna adjust themselves, it's just where I set it, and having the clock speed locked to 5.2, 
means that as we do our A-B testing, nothing is gonna change in terms of the motherboard dynamically adjusting things which will affect our, our results, which does nothing then show how well does the motherboard handle changes with this cooler rather than how does this cooler compare to something else. And then this is the only cooler we're comparing it to because it's already on the system. Realistically, I should be comparing this to another $75 air cooler of some sort, but I don't have one, doesn't matter. At the end of the day, I'm not comparing this to something else for the sake of saying it's better than or not as good as. I am just saying, here's the performance and that you can expect out of a $75 cooler that has an LCD screen. Well, not even LCD screen, I guess it's LED screen, whatever. NZXT's build is a quick and easy way to get a new gaming computer. Build a gaming PC on your budget using the built-in configurator and see exactly how your favorite games will perform. Want to build your own PC but still have the NZXT peace of mind warranty? Then the new BLD Build-It-Yourself kit has what you want. Buy it and build it yourself and NZXT has you covered. To get started configuring or building your next gaming PC, visit the build link in the description below. You know, it's times like this I really realize how spoiled we were in the day uh, with temperatures. Look at this, 71, 72 on the package, max is hit 74, and then yeah, I'm pointing a, there we go, okay. High 60s, low 70s, hottest core got to 74. Man, we were spoiled with 10th gen and we didn't even know it. 11th gen was all right, 12th gen was like, oh boy, and 13th gen, pfft. You can't keep cramming cores and CPUs though and, not ex and, and then crank them up to almost six gigahertz both on AMD and Intel and not expect high temperatures. So that's where we're gonna stop the test because it's not getting any hotter, it's just, that's where it stopped. Um, the air coming through the cooler, hell, the fans haven't even ramped up, so. So I kind of prematurely installed my bracket here when it comes to the bracketry because this, once you get that little nub part installed, you get this tightened down, you get all four of them on there, then you mount this under the motherboard, you put this on the top, right? It's already spaced kind of exactly where it should be. Then you take this guy right here and you can screw that down on there. Use your screwdriver, get it snug, don't over tighten it because you'll strip it out. So that's what you'll see like on the motherboard. And then once the motherboard's attached, then you take this guy and then you can mount it down. Now, basically, you need to make sure you get this oriented properly, otherwise you'll have the screen facing the wrong way like I already showed. But it's really only gonna be an issue on Intel that you could be 90 degrees off because it's a square, so you can turn it 90 degrees. On AMD, it could be either right side up or completely upside down. So again, just kind of make sure the orientation before you go to mount it down. Now that the system's off and cooled down, let me go ahead and get this mounted up and then we'll show you guys what the final install looks like. So slight installation correction, although this isn't a guide on how to install it. The black washer goes in between the motherboard and the plate. Uh, that way it can clear the bracket for the back of the CPU socket. So I just wanted to correct that real quick. If you were somehow using this as an install guide, which you shouldn't be, you should be using the manual. Shit. So there's the cooler installed with the bracket and stuff. I never even noticed that the top of the heat pipes also has a heat sink on it, which is kind of neat. So that helps sink a little bit of heat away. As with most big coolers, unfortunately, it, it does overhang over the closest RAM uh, dim slot to the CPU. Now these are extra tall RAM sticks, obviously from, from Corsair. I cannot tell if a standard stick will fit there because I don't have any DDR4 um, without a heat sink on it, I don't think. I don't, so I can't really show you. I'm looking at that height going, a regular stick that doesn't have any extra height might fit there. The problem is like just about all modern RAM these days have these extra tall heat sinks. But because I still only run two sticks uh, in my systems with as much capacity in those two sticks that I can af afford, um, for the best performance in terms of overclocking and such, because I do overclock my system. So two will fit there just fine. And as you can see, because I have this set up as a standard layout, so even though it's an open air test bench, this is where the back of the case would be. So you can see now I've got my display appropriate to where, don't tip over, please. I should weight that down, just leave it like a regular system like that. So as you can see, if this were a regular case, ah, it's attack of the AIOs. You can see it's upright. You can see how the stick does over lay this fan like a little bit, blocks a little bit of the airflow, but it will also pull some air through the stick because these sticks do have vents right there. So there's your standard airflow. You could rotate this 90 degrees as an Intel and make it exhaust towards the top, but then your screen would be sideways. So keep that in mind, depending on your location of your, your sticks um, and in relation to the CPU socket, you probably are gonna lose one stick of accessibility. So we're seeing a temp on there right now it's just stuck at 24. Reading the reviews, some people said it didn't, like nothing even showed on there until you downloaded the software. I also saw a lot of people in reviews saying it only shows the heat pipe temp, but that hasn't changed from 24. So I'm just gonna download the software, which is taking forever because it's 
probably in the UK, or not the UK, but in China. It's only getting 400 kilobytes a second download. The installation was pretty straightforward. The fans are a little bit on the noisy side. They're not the quietest fans. Um, they are set to, a, I think, 100% right now. So there's our CPU at 53C. Now it shows a CPU temp. So I bet you that first temp is either just it powered on and it's not doing anything until it sees the CPU. Otherwise, um, yeah, we're seeing CPU temp now. So that's kind of neat. So that should match on here, right? 46, 32, yeah, nice. And air coolers do not take long to get up to their max temp. So let's just kind of do this one. We'll do it live! <laughs> let's look at this cooler. 75, 77, 80. It crashed. It's got it, I don't know. Because that temperature, that should not have crashed at that temp. All right, here we go, take two. I've never had a cooler cause a crash before. 62, 58, 73, 76, 79, 80. It crashed at the same exact spot at the same temperature. All right, so you can see we're gonna go from sync all cores 5.2 down to 5.1. We now have a 200 megahertz all core overclock. 4.9 is where the thermal velocity boost allows it to go. 5.1, enter. That was weird, I hit enter. I thought, anyway. Yeah, I guess that just means that the way this was dialed in with that three, that 5.2 gigahertz on that 360 was just that 10, 10 degrees difference was the, the difference between stability. And we've talked about this a million times. Coolers are important because just because you stay under the TJ Maxx of the CPU does not mean it's gonna be stable at the overclock under TJ Maxx. The colder the CPU is down to a certain point is more stable. And that has everything to do with just the, the efficiency of the power draw through heat. So already dropping 100 megahertz because of the CPU or the cooler. Now I wanna see now, will the, will it still crash with the software open? Okay, so you can see pulling it back 100 megahertz we're at 85C on the package. Showing 87 for Yeah, there it is, 87. We're seeing mid to upper 80s on the core. Now remember, this is a 105C TJ Maxx on this CPU. So anything up to 90 or up to 104 will give you full speed, but it doesn't mean we'll be stable at that. There's 90. Yeah, there's 90, 91. I'm just gonna go ahead and set this a little, a little bit of a duration now. I wanna see how hot it'll get. That's a little unfortunate. I, I think I expected better performance out of this cooler. If you look at the fin density on it though, it's not very dense. Um, six heat pipes is great, but the fins themselves are what's responsible for taking the heat out of the pipe and then moving it to the atmosphere. Having push-pull on there definitely helps, but I feel like that old Vitru cooler that I've sworn by would actually outperform this. Again, we're not throttling because of it, at least we shouldn't be. Yeah, we still got our 5.1 gigahertz all core overclock. It is pulling 257 watts. So we are asking a lot of wattage out of this cooler. And that's why I really wish it just would tell us what the wattage um, rating of this cooler is. I have a feeling we're at the upper end of it. Now, 9293C is scary to see on a big cooler like that, but keep this in mind, uh, Cinebench R23 is a very difficult task. It, basically, we look at it this way. If a cooler can survive Cinebench without throttling, then it can survive any of your gaming, any of your video editing, any of your rendering without fault. So this, we had to drop 100 megahertz and gain 14C, no, 15, 25C, sorry, because we were at 70, 71. So we gained 25C by going down from the 360 AIO to this, uh, this air cooler here. Now, I don't know anything about it. I don't know how, many, how much wattage it can hold. In fact, I need to look up a product page or something. So looking at their website, we cannot find any information about wattage dissipation. However, looking at the Amazon page, I did see this right here. Wattage, 135 watts. Now, if you, that can't be how much power it draws. Could you imagine a 135 watt cooler? If this is a 135 watt t like dissipation cooler, I'm both impressed and disappointed. So here's the thing. I was initially disappointed going, wow, I, I mean, that sucks that it couldn't keep this under 90s. But if it really is 135 watt dissipation, which uh, that's the only place I mention, I can find any mention of heat, I went from being disappointed in it to impressed by it. Because as you saw, it's a 257 watt under load with my overclock applied to that 10900K. So here's what we're gonna do now. Just to be fair, 250 something watts dissipation, or 250 watts power draw on the CPU with all the limits and stuff disabled is its max. 
Now, out-of-the-box settings won't go that high, usually. So what I'm gonna do now, just to be fair, is I am going to reset the BIOS to the factory defaults with all the limits and stuff applied, and I wanna see now how the cooler performs in a realistic out-of-the-box scenario. Because, like I said, I went from being disappointed in this cooler to impressed. Impressed appointed. I'm, yeah, I'm impressed appointed and, and disimpressed. That's, that's what I am right now, okay? 4.9 gigahertz, all core as expected. 65, 67, 69, 70, 71, 69, 72. And our CPU is now pulling uh, 210 watts. I mean, it's down to 60C now towards the end of the test. That middle part of the test is very difficult to run when it's doing the couch and the fibers. Uh, 59C, because we lost our turbo timer, we're now down to 4.2. So that's how thermal velocity boost works, folks. You only get the advertised speed for a little bit, and then you massively drop your speeds we're at 4.3 now, and our temperatures are in the upper 50s. Conclusion time. I'm glad that the software wasn't crashing it. I'm disappointed that it's only 135 watt cooler. I'm impressed that it was able to keep this CPU, which is a minimum 210 watt under load at AVX instruction set, down into the high, well, high mid 70s under that load until thermal velocity boost hits and then drops down to the 50s, which is great, but I'm disappointed in the fact that it's a $75 cooler to do that. When essentially it really seems like it's something like an Evo 212 cooler, with some screen slapped on it, some trim put on it, and two okay-ish fans. Yeah, I guess I should have looked at the listing a little bit better if I had seen, because here's the crazy part. The Pure Rock LP, which I already showed a second ago, this little bitty little guy is a 100 watt cooler. That means this. 35% less cooling than that. Than that. <laughs> so, I mean, there's that. I, I just, I don't know, I have to feel like, I feel sort of like that 135 watt is just an arbitrary number thrown out there. I, I can't, I can't find it's any validity to it. Because if it really was 135 watt max TDP, I would have to assume that right now, what are the powers right now? Okay, right, 125 watts with all of the Intel limits applied and thermal velocity boost over. So we went from like a high 16,000 score to a 14,700 but we've lost almost a whole gigahertz to bring it down to that wattage. But as you can see, at 125 watts, it's doing very well, which means it's gotta be higher than 135, so I don't know. Anyway, there you go. I just saw this thing, I figured I'd do a review on it. People are always shopping for this sort of stuff, and uh, now you know, depending on, uh, here's the thing, if you're running like a 12th gen, 13th gen, or an AMD 7000 series, I, I would not put this on there, honestly, I wouldn't. Unless you were running some sort of a mid-range, CPU like a 7600 with 7000 series, or maybe like a 12300, 12400, 13400, 1312, or 13100, whatever, then I'd maybe consider this CPU cooler, but not at that price. That's where you can still get yourself like that V2 cooler I showed you for 30 bucks or whatever, 40 bucks now, that will probably severely outperform this. If I had the time right now, I would throw it on and compare. If you guys want me to compare it, maybe, do you guys want me to do like a Amazon cooler shootout video? If you want me to, sound off down below, I'll do that. Otherwise, there you go. I would maybe avoid this one just from the cost. The screen is neat, but it's not worth the, the compromise you have to make in its cooling capacity. The RGB works because it's plugged into the motherboard. So it's gonna do whatever your motherboard ARGB header is doing, even though the fact that the actual manual says controlled by Aura, because obviously any motherboard three pin is gonna control it. All right guys, thanks for watching. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.